بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad we've reached what we can call the the middle of the Meccan period we spoke about the the major events that took place during the the early years of the prophetic mission we spoke at length about the persecution of the early muslims we discussed the emigration the two emigrations to abyssinia we spoke about the conversion of najashi to islam and the the correspondence that he had with the Prophet ﷺ through his emissaries. And in this episode, I'd like to begin a new discussion on an event that some historians believe took place during the middle of the Meccan period. And I'll explain why uh, I'm qualifying that statement with some. Inshallah, beginning in this episode and perhaps over the next, uh, even into the next episode, we'll be speaking about Al Isra wal Mi'raj, which is the, the night journey and the ascension of the Prophet. Now, this event, this important event in the biography of the Prophet, is actually referenced in the Quran. Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj is mentioned explicitly in two places in the Qur'an. Now, before we get into the verses, just a little bit about the, the linguistic meanings of Isra and Mi'raj. Now, the word Isra literally means a journey that takes place at night, a night journey. And Mi'raj you know, comes from the word, you know, uruj, which is basically the, the, the thing that makes you ascend. The instrument of ascension or elevation. That's, those are the literal meanings of Isra and Mi'raj. Now, of course, the technical meaning in, in our context, it refers to the night journey of the Prophet ﷺ from the sacred mosque in Mecca to the remote mosque in Jerusalem, Masjid al-Aqsa. And the Mi'raj refers to the, what we can call the vertical ascension, the vertical journey of the Prophet, where the Prophet ascends through the heavens. He accesses and he explores the deeper realms of the kingdom of God. As for the Isra, we read in Surah Al-Isra, Surah number 17, Ayah number 1, Subhana alladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawla linuriyahu min ayatina innahu huwa al-sami'u al-basir. Glory be to him who made his servant go on a night journey from the sacred mosque to the remote mosque of which we have blessed the surroundings. What was the purpose of this night journey? So again, we're speaking about the, the horizontal journey of the Prophet from Mecca to Jerusalem. Allah says the reason, and of course, notice that the, the verse begins with Subhan. Right? And it begins with Subhan because Subhan is to negate any inability or imperfection or weakness from God. And the idea here is that, yes, this sounds unbelievable. This sounds astonishing. But Allah is is capable of facilitating such an experience. And the purpose of this night journey is so that Allah 
can show his messenger some of his signs. لِنُورِيَهُ This is not an arbitrary journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just giving the Prophet a tour just for the sake of giving him a tour. لِنُورِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا So that he can be shown the signs of God. لِنُورِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ So here, in the first verse of Surah Al-Isra, there's an explicit verse here that mentions this night journey of the Prophet. His movement from Masjid Al-Haram to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And Al-Aqsa basically means the furthest, the most remote masjid. So that's with respect to the Isra. Now the Mi'raj, as we said, it refers to the vertical. Now when I say vertical here, we're not speaking about direction. We're speaking about, you know, rank. So this is the Mi'raj of the Prophet is basically a, a movement of some sorts. From the physical realms to the immaterial realms. To the heavens. And this Mi'raj is mentioned in Surah An Najm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ma kathab al fu'ad ma ra'a. Surah 53, verses 11 to 18. Ma kathab al fu'ad ma ra'a. Afatumarunahu ala ma yara. The heart belied not what he saw. Do you then dispute with him concerning what he sees? وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى عِنْدَ سِدْرَةِ الْمُنْتَهَى And he saw him once again by the farthest lot tree. عِنْدَهَا جَنَّةُ الْمَأْوَى Nearby, which is the garden of repose, which is جَنَّةُ الْمَأْوَى إِذْ يَغْشَ السِدْرَةَ مَا يَغْشَى مَا زَاغَ الْبَصَرُ وَمَا طَغَى لَقَدْ رَآ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى At that time, the lot tree was covered with that which covered it. The sight was neither dazzled, nor it exceeded the limit. And he saw of the greatest signs of his Lord. So you see that the purpose of both the Isra and the Mi'raj is for the Prophet ﷺ to witness the wondrous signs of his Lord. Now, there are many ahadith. So we have two Qur'anic verses. We have two places in the Qur'an, not two Qur'anic verses, but we have two places in the Qur'an which clearly reference the Isra and the Mi'raj. Now, the bulk of the information that we have on what actually happened during the Isra and Mi'raj, we collect it from Hadith literature. Now, there is so much, there are so many narrations that detail the Prophet Sallallahu experience. And it can be quite overwhelming because the, the sheer number of traditions are are, are really great in number. And it's difficult to, to sift through these narrations and really construct you know, uh, a coherent uh, narrative. You know, a lot of, uh, you'll, you'll find bits and pieces of this story scattered through the books of Hadith. And you find that when it comes to, and the, oftentimes you'll come across a Hadith where it seems that there are some embellishments, there are some exaggerations, perhaps there are even fabrications. And this is what prompted Alam al-Majlisi to classify, to categorize the traditions that speak about the Isra and the Mi'raj into, into one of four categories. So any hadith, any narration that you find on the Isra and Mi'raj are going to fall into one of these four categories. 
And this is mentioned by Alam al-Majlisi in Bihar al-Anwar. He has uh, a section uh, on, on the categorization of these traditions. Number one. So the four types of ahadith regarding the Isra and the Mi'raj. Number one, we have certain ahadith whose content we are certain of. It gives us epistemological certainty. Why? Because of tawatur. Because we have so many independent reports on this specific issue that it gives us certainty that it happened. And an example is the event of the Mi'raj or the Isra and the Mi'raj itself, the, the actual event, not the details. We know with certainty because of the widespread transmission of the story from independent people, independent reports, the fact that it's mentioned in the Qur'an, we know for certain that something happened. The Prophet experienced a night journey and a mi'raj. That we are certain of. So that's an example of the first category of narrations, where the, we are we're certain of the content because of tawatur or because it's mentioned in the Qur'an explicitly. So, it, so the traditions actually repeat that which is mentioned in the Qur'an. The second is traditions which are rationally possible and do not contradict any Qur'anic principles. So this second group of ahadith, they're not mutawatir, meaning that we don't have so many of them, so many independent reports where it gives us epistemological certainty that it took place without a doubt. However, we have some ahadith, a few of them, and what's being mentioned, the content of the hadith is rationally possible, and there is nothing in these traditions that contradict the established Qur'anic principles. They don't contradict the Qur'an. So for instance, the narrations that tell us that during the Mi'raj, for example, that Rasulullah met other prophets, that the prophet saw the pleasures and he witnessed the beauty of paradise, that he witnessed the horrors of the hellfire. These traditions, they're not mutawatir, they are, you know, we have a number of them. There's nothing that is illogical about them. They're, they are rationally possible and they don't contradict any Qur'anic principles. The third category of traditions are those riwayat, those narrations whose apparent meanings contradicts Qur'anic principles. However, they can be interpreted in a way which resolves the problem and it conforms with reason. So for example, we know that people will go to hellfire or paradise after the day of judgment. The Quran is rather clear about this. That people will enter Jannah after the day of judgment, after their hisab after they are, they are resurrected. So there is, there is no one in the eternal paradise right now. There is no one who is in the, the, the hellfire, the actual hellfire, not the barzakhi or paradise or the barzakhi hellfire. I'm talking about the, the, the hell and the, the paradise, which is the abodes which people will enter after their reckoning. So the Qur'an is clear that these places, they will be occupied, they will be filled after the hisab on the Day of Judgment. Now we have narrations that the Prophet ﷺ during the Mi'raj, he saw people in Jannah and he saw people in Hellfire. 
So here, this contradicts the apparent meaning of the Qur'an. However, with these narrations, they can be reinterpreted in a way that does not contradict the Qur'an. So these are, this is an example of the third category of traditions, where the, the reports seem to contradict the apparent message of the Qur'an. However, there is an interpretation that can be offered and presented that resolves that contradiction, and there's nothing about it that contradicts uh, reason. Number four, traditions which contradict Qur'anic principles and they do not conform with reason. And this fourth category of traditions, we are confident that they are fabrications. You know, because in, in the world of hadith, you come across many narrations that are clearly forged, they're fabricated, they do not conform with the Qur'an, nor do they conform with, with reason and rationality. And an example of such traditions are the reports about the Mi'raj where the Prophet allegedly saw Allah with his physical eyes and he sat beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his seat and so on and so forth. And so of course the traditions that attribute, that anthropomorphize God during the Prophet's ascension, these are narrations that we can discard because they contradict the Qur'an and they also contradict reason. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a bodily entity that can be witnessed with uh, the physical eyes. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ So that's a little bit about the, the way in which we can group the reports about the Isra and the Mi'raj. Now, at the beginning of the episode, I said that some Muslim historians place the incident of the Isra and the Mi'raj during the middle of the Meccan period. Now, when did this event take place? And I said some because there is a difference of opinion regarding when the night journey and ascension took place. There's ikhtilaf, there's dispute, there's disagreement about the exact date. And when I say exact date, I'm not even talking about the day, nor even the month. There is dispute about even the year. So the date of the Mi'raj of the Prophet has been recorded by two major Muslim historians. So if you look at the, the seerah of Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, and these are you know probably the, the two most prominent and authoritative historians, they, they say that the, the Isra and the Mi'raj of the Prophet took place shortly before the Hijrah. So approximately a year, a year and a half, maybe two years before the Prophet emigrates to Medina. So Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, they say, they argue that the Mi'raj took place during the later Meccan period. Another great Muslim historian, Al-Bayhaqi, he says that the Mi'raj took place in the 12th year of the Bi'tha. So this is literally the last year in, in Mecca. Other historians say that the, the Mi'raj took place at the beginning of the Bi'tha, at the beginning of the Prophet's mission. So others have said, no, it took place during the middle of the, the Meccan period. So, why is there so much confusion? Why is there, why, why is there so much disagreement about the event of the Mi'raj? Now, some scholars 
have reconciled the discrepancy because we have conflicting reports about when the the Isra and the Mi'raj took place. Some ulama say that the reason for this discrepancy in the reports is because the Prophet actually went on multiple ascensions. So Isra may have happened once, but the Mi'raj happened multiple times in the life of the Prophet. And the reason why is the reason why we can safely conclude this is we know it's an established fact, there's a consensus among Muslims that Salah was legislated during the Mi'raj. Salah in its current form was taught to the Prophet during the Mi'raj. And we know for certain that Muslims were not praying in the way that we pray during the middle of the Meccan period. We know that we know that for certain. There are even a hadith that say Khadija died before Salah in its current form became wajib. And we know that Khadija died, you know, in the later Meccan period. Now, keeping this in mind, keeping in mind that prayer was legislated during the Mi'raj, after the death of Khadija, that means at least one Mi'raj must have taken place during the late Meccan period. And we also know from the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, that there must have been a mi'raj before the birth of Fatima al-Zahra. Fatima al-Zahra, according to our traditions, she was born in the fifth year after the Bi'tha. She was born in the fifth year after the Bi'tha. And we have the following narration from Imam al-Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi. An Abi Abdullah qal, the narration is from the sixth Imam, قال كان النبي صلى الله عليه وآله يكثر تقبيل فاطمة عليه السلام. The Prophet used to frequently and abundantly kiss his daughter Fatima. The Prophet used to embrace her, kiss her often. فعاتبته على ذلك عائشة. Aisha blamed him for this. She basically protested. And again, you know, this is you know another indication of the the envy that Aisha had towards Fatima al Zahra. And, and really it's it's uh, directed at Khadija. We know for a fact that Aisha was intensely envious of Khadija, and of course Fatima is the daughter of, of Khadija. So you see that, that there was this, uh, this jealousy that was boiling within her. So Aisha objects. Now, I mean, this is also strange, the fact that why would you object over a father who's kissing his daughter? Why does that, why does that bother you? In any case... فَقَالَتْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّكَ لَتَكْثُرُ تَقْبِيلَ فَاطِمَةً That you kiss Fatima too much. It's too much. فَقَالَ لَهَا What was the Prophet's response? Did he say to her, yes, you're right, I need to maybe tone it down? No. He explains to her why he is so fond of Fatima. فَقَالَ لَهَا إِنَّهُ لَمَّا عُرِجَ بِي إِلَى السَّمَاءِ مَرَّ بِي جِبْرَائِيلَ عَلَى شَجَرَةِ طُوبَى The Prophet says that when I went on, when I ascended into the heavens, the angel Gabriel, Jibrail, took me 
to the tree of Tuba, which is in paradise. It's in Jannah. And he gave me one of the fruits of this heavenly tree. And I ate from it. Allah transformed that food that I consumed into the life seed, into the life seed of Fatima. So it basically became the, the liquid from which you know human beings are created. After I ate from this fruit and I returned from this ascension, I had relations with Khadija and she became pregnant with Fatima. Rasulullah says, whenever I kiss Fatima, I can smell the fragrance of that heavenly tree. Now the reason why we're mentioning this is because Fatima al Zahra was born when? She was born the fifth year after the Bi'tha. So on this Mi'raj, Salah was not mandated. Salah was not legislated. So this is an indication that there were there was more than one mi'raj now the question is if there were multiple ascensions how many were there exactly how many times did the prophet go on mi'raj now as i mentioned the uh, the narrations of ahlul bayt don't mention multiple night journeys we don't have any evidence that the prophet went on Isra multiple times. You know, his his night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, the Quran mentions one time, and the ahadith are silent about it happening more than once. And by the way, the, the Isra, and we'll mention this, it there's a there's a dispute among scholars as to where it began in Mecca. Is it Masjid al-Haram, the sacred mosque itself, or is it this the Mecca? So there's there's ikhtilaf on this issue, and, and we'll get to that in, the, in a minute. So how many times did the Prophet experience Mi'raj? There's a narration. So again, these are solitary reports. We don't we can't say that this narration is 100% authentic and it gives us epistemological certainty. It's a narration that's mentioned. It doesn't contradict reason, nor does it, nor does it contradict any Qur'anic principles. It's possible, so we, we keep an open mind and we say that it's possible that, that, that the number that's going to be mentioned is, is true. There's a narration attributed to Imam al-Sadiq where he says, عُرِجَ بِالنَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ مِئَةَ وَعِشْرِينَ مَرَّةِ When I read this hadith, I was shocked. Imam al-Sadiq says the Prophet was made to ascend into the skies, into the heavens, 120 times. 120 times. One of those times was when Salah was mandated. Another one of those times was when he consumed from the, the, the heavenly tree and that tree uh, became, the fruit of that tree became the life germ, the life seed of Lady Fatima alayhi salam. And then the Imam continues. So 120, 120 times according to Imam al-Sadiq, ما من مرة إلا وقد أوصى الله عز وجل فيها النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم بالولاية لعلي والأئمة عليهم السلام أكثر مما أوصاه بالفرائض. Imam al-Sadiq he says that each of those 120 times that the Prophet ascended. There was nothing that was more emphasized to Rasulullah than 
the guardianship, the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, more than any of the other wajibat. It's because the wilaya, you know, who to follow after the Prophet, this involves the preservation of Islam itself. The preservation of the fara'ib are through the, the wilaya. Now another question. So from this narration from Imam al-Sadiq, Mi'raj took place multiple times. Imam al-Sadiq mentions 120 times. Now, did this happen when we speak about the night journey and the ascension? Was this a dream or did this happen when the Prophet was conscious, when he was awake? So did this occur when the Prophet was asleep or when he was wakeful, when he was awake? Now there is dispute, you know, there are some Sunni scholars that believe that this was, this was, there was no bodily ascension. This is, this was basically a vision that the Prophet saw in his dream. And even among Shi'i scholars, there is a discussion about whether this was bodily and spiritual or just spiritual. Of course, the general consensus among Shi'i scholars is that the Mi'raj was both bodily and spiritual. And when I say bodily, I don't mean physical. And the reason why is because those samawat, those heavens that the Prophet will traverse, there are realms that the Prophet enters that are immaterial. Or at the very least, they are latif, they are very subtle. And therefore, when we say, if we say that the, if, when we say that the, the Prophet had a bodily ascension, we don't mean with his physical body which is made out of blood and flesh. We mean bodily in a way that is appropriate. It's a body that is, that is appropriate and compatible with those worlds and with those realms. Similar to the body that you have in your dreams. Because it doesn't make sense to say that the Prophet with his physical body that he has on earth, with that same physical body, he is traversing immaterial realms. This doesn't make sense. This is illogical. Now, there's a very interesting conversation between Amir al muminin and someone who denied the Mi'raj. So the deniers of the Mi'raj even existed during the time of the Prophet, even during the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Imam al-Sadiq, he reports, قال Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Amir al-Mu'mineen narrates, وَأَمَّا الرَّدُّ عَلَى مَنْ أَنْكَرَ الْمِعْرَاجِ Imam says, a response that can be given to those who deny the reality of Mi'raj, the reality of the Prophet's ascension. فَقَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى Let them look at the Qur'an. وَهُوَ بِالْأُفُقِ الْأَعْلَى ثُمَّ دَنَا فَتَدَلَّى And he recites those verses from Surah Al-Najm. Where Sidratul Muntaha is mentioned. And then the Imam says, فَسِدْرَةُ الْمُنْتَهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ السَّابِعَةِ Sidratul Muntaha, the the low tree of the 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 the, the, out, the furthest boundary of the of the heavens. This is in the seventh heaven, and then the Imam mentions a verse from Surah Zukhruf, where Allah says, "Wasl," addressing the Prophet, "Wasl man arsalna min qablika min rusulina." Allah tells the Prophet that ask, ask those 
whom we have sent before you as messengers. Did we set up any other gods along with the beneficent to be worshipped? So here, Allah is commanding the Prophet to ask previous messengers a question. Now, so if, if all of the prophets have died, and it's not, po- it's not possible for the prophet to speak to them, what does this verse mean? Imam Amir al muminin he says, وَإِنَّمَا أَمَرَ تَعَالَى رَسُولَهُ أَنْ يَسْأَلَ الرُّسُلْ فِي السَّمَاءِ Imam Amir al muminin he says, this ayah is a command for the prophet to ask the messengers that he sees in those realms during the Mi'raj. And he's speaking not to their physical bodies. He's speaking to the barzakhi forms of their bodies. He's speaking to, so when the Prophet sees Ibrahim and Musa, he's not seeing their physical bodies. He's seeing their barzakhi bodies, which is a more subtle, it's a mithali body. There's a narration from Ali ibn Ibrahim al-Qummi from Imam al-Sadiq where he says, and we'll begin our discussion on the Isra, and then inshallah we'll speak about uh, the Mi'raj. The narration from Imam al-Sadiq says, so when we speak about the Isra, we're speaking about this horizontal journey. And then inshallah in our next episode, we'll speak about the Mi'raj. Now as for the Isra, which means the night journey. And I, ma- I mentioned that the Quran says, Subhan al-Ladhi Asra bi'abdihi laylan min al-Masjid al-Harami ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa. So the starting point of this night journey is the sacred mosque. Masjid al-Haram and the, en- the destination is what? Masjid al-Aqsa. Some narrations mention that the Prophet on this night, when this journey took place, he was in the home of Umhani. Umhani, her name is Fakhita, and she was the sister of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Prophet was staying with her and her husband, and the Isra took place when he was with her. Other narrations mention that he was physically in Masjid al-Haram, but Again, these are the reports that are mentioned. Imam al-Sadiq says, جَاءَ جِبْرَائِيلُ وَمِيكَائِيلُ وَإِسْرَافِيلُ بِالْبُرَاقِ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Imam al-Sadiq says, Jibrail, Mikail, and Israfil, they brought the Buraq to the Prophet. Now, Buraq, People, when they speak about this, this story of the night journey of the Prophet, they say, oh, this is a winged horse. And, you know, some Orientalists, they mock and they ridicule Muslims for believing that the Prophet, you know, rode on a winged horse from Mecca to Jerusalem. And with this winged horse, he flew through the, the universe, the heavens. And I even remember, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins, you know, ridiculing Muslims who actually believe in a winged horse. We have to remember, brothers and sisters, that the language that is used in these traditions need to be understood, in many cases, to be figurative. Because we don't know what the reality of this buraq is. By the, word, by the way, the word buraq comes from the word barq, which literally means lightning, something that is extremely fast. So this buraq that the, the narration meant, this is the thing, the vehicle that Allah used to facilitate this journey. The, the, horizon, the, the horizontal as well as the vertical. Now, the only way for the imams and the prophets to explain what this thing is, is to use language that is understandable to the listener. The fastest vehicle in the mind 
of the seventh century Arab is what? The horse. Now, so we have to keep we have to keep this in mind. You know, this is like us trying to explain an airplane to someone who lived five hundred years ago. What are you going to say? You're going to say it's like a bird. That it's it's a bird that people can sit in, and we put chairs inside of this large iron bird. So it sounds silly, but this is the, this is the, it sounds silly to those who cannot comprehend the reality of this vehicle. So Jibrail, Mikael, and Israel, Israfil brought the Burak to the Prophet. Now, question: Is this Burak? Is it physical? Meaning, if I was standing next to the Prophet would I be, be able to see the Burak? Would I be able to see Jibra'il and me? The answer is no. Because everything that the Prophet is going to witness on this night journey, as well as the ascension, is something that only his soul has the capacity to witness. And an example that we can give is when Maryam was in her mihrab and she saw Jibra'il in human form. Tamathul, fatamathala laha basharan sawiyya. When Maryam was in her mihrab, Jibra'il, she had a vision of Jibra'il. Jibra'il manifested himself to her in that form. Fatamathala laha, there was tamathul. It was a vision that was that was only seeable by Maryam. Meaning, if I was in, if I was with Maryam, I would not have been able to see what she sees. Why? Because my soul does not have the capacity to witness those realities. Do you think anybody can see what Maryam saw in that mihrab? Do you think you and I we can witness? We can see because. What the Prophet is seeing is not with his physical eyes. These are all visions of the heart. And the heart cannot perceive these things unless it is purified. Because now you are, you are interacting with higher realities. And the language that's being used is being dumbed down for us to understand. So we have to approach Isra and Mi'raj literature with that mindset. Now in any case, continuing the, the narration, and there's a lot of symbolism in these narrations, so we shouldn't take a lot of what we're reading literally. So, Jibra'il, Mika'il, Israfil brought the Burak to the Prophet. One of these three held the reins of the Burak. Again, reins. This is the only word that can be used. What is the reality of these reins? We don't know. While the other one held on the saddle. Again, saddle. the word saddle is being used because it's the closest thing. It's the only word that can be used to convey something that is remotely similar to what the Prophet is experiencing. And the third one held on to the clothing of the Prophet while he was ascending on it, meaning the Burak. And I'll just read the, the English just for the sake of time. When the Prophet ﷺ mounted onto the Burak, its entire body started to tremble. Now body here does not necessarily mean physical. Don't conflate body with physical. Because in Alam al-Barzakh, people also have bodies. When you have dreams, you have a body in your dream. But that's not a physical body. That's a lighter body. It's a, it's a mithali body. Its entire body started to tremble. Jibra'il pointed with his hand towards the Burak and told him, O Burak, keep calm. Before the Prophet, no other Prophet has ever ridden you. And after him too, no one like him will ever ride upon you again. 
So the Buraq became tranquil by the words of Jibra'il and it took the Prophet ﷺ towards the heavens. And Jibra'il accompanied the Prophet. So this is the narration of Imam al-Sadiq. The, the Prophet accompanied, Jibra'il accompanied the Prophet and pointed out the signs of Allah in the heavens and the earth. The Prophet ﷺ stated, We were continuing when I heard someone call me by my name. Again, if we were with the Prophet, we would probably not hear anything or not see anything. This is something that the soul of the Prophet is experiencing. He is actually seeing things. These are visions. These are apparitions. But only the Prophet has the capacity to see this. So the Prophet said, we were continuing when I heard someone call me by my name. I did not pay attention to it and continued on our course. Another time, I heard someone else call me by my name. Again, I did not pay attention to it. Then I saw a woman whose hands were uncovered and all of the ornaments and the beautifications of the material world were on her. She said, O Muhammad, wait. I have something to say to you. However, I paid no attention to her either. After this, I heard another sound which startled me. That sound too I ignored. After some time, so now the Prophet, and this is all, this is all mentioned in Bihar and Anwar, the Prophet continues reporting and he says, after some time, as, and this is the, the Isra, the, the night journey, after some time, Jibra'il stopped. So Jibra'il is accompanying the Prophet who's on the Buraq. Jibra'il said to me, so we stopped suddenly, and Jibra'il said to me, perform salah, pray, pray here. The Prophet said, I dismounted from the Buraq and performed my salah. Jibra'il said to me, Tadri ayna salli, do you know where you just prayed, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet said, No, I don't know. Faqal sallayta bitiba o bitayiba wa ilayha muhajaratuk. Ya Rasulullah, you just prayed in Tayyiba, which is one of the names of Medina. And this is the place where you will one day emigrate. This will be the place of your hijrah one day. So you see how blessed the city of Medina is, that it's one of the places that the Prophet stops to perform salah on his way to Masjid al-Aqsa. ثُمَّ رَكِبْتُ فَمَضَيْنَا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ After this, I got back onto the Buraq and we continued on our journey once again. Then again, Jibra'il, we stopped and Jibra'il said to me, pray, perform the prayer. I once again dismounted the Buraq and I performed my Salah there. And Jibra'il again asked me, do you know where you just prayed? The Prophet said, no. And Jibra'il says to him, Sallayta bituri sina." Ya Rasulullah, you prayed in Mount Sinai. This is where Allah spoke to Musa. Once again, the Prophet says, I ascended the Buraq and continued on my way until Allah would decree something else. Shortly afterwards, Jibra'il said, Get down and recite salah, pray. And then again, Jibra'il would ask the Prophet, do you know where you are praying? Do you know where you just prayed? The Prophet said, I don't know. Jibra'il says that this is Bethlehem, which is near Baytul Maqdis. This is the birthplace of Isa alayhi salam. We reached Baytul Maqdis and I proceeded, 
the Prophet says, I proceeded to tie the reins of the Buraq to the same ring, the same post that the great prophets before me used to tie their animals to. So Masjid al-Aqsa is a place that was visited by all of the, the prophets and the messengers. And again, at this time, perhaps there was no physical building there. But again, the prophet is perhaps seeing it before it was demolished or he's seeing it, he's envisioning it in a way that is not seeable to anyone else but him in any case the prophet says after this I entered the masjid and it was there that I met Ibrahim, Musa, Isa and the rest of the prophets as I mentioned brothers and sisters Rasulullah did not see the physical Ibrahim or the physical Musa or the physical Isa, meaning that they're not flesh and blood. He is seeing their barzakhi bodily forms. And this is something that only the Prophet can see. They all gathered around me, the Prophet said, and we proceeded to get ready for salah. The Prophet says that I had no doubt that the prayer would be led by Jibra'il. Jibra'il is the archangel, the most supreme angel created by God. However, when the lines for the prayer were being formed, Jibra'il placed his hand on my shoulder and nudged me forward. Jibra'il also took part in the salah behind me along with the various prophets. So all of the prophets, can you imagine this scene? 124,000 prophets or so are praying behind Rasulullah. Jibra'il is behind the prophet. He's leading them in prayer. However, this did not cause any pride or vanity in me. There was no arrogance or feeling of supremacy in the heart of the prophet. Following this, the custodian of the masjid, perhaps an angel, brought three vessels in front of me. In the first vessel was milk. In the second was water. And the third was wine. All of a sudden, I heard someone say, if he takes the vessel of water, he will perish. And his nation will perish. And if he takes the vessel of wine, he and his nation will all be led astray. However, if he drinks the milk, then he has been guided and his nation too will be guided. I proceeded, the Prophet says, I proceeded to take the vessel containing the milk and drank from it. Jibra'il said, know that you have been guided and your nation too has been guided. Now what is the meaning of this, uh, the drinking of the vessels? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, brothers and sisters. There's, you can tell by even reading this, there is so much symbolism and it's enshrouded in, in mystery. But it shows you that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, you know, of, of, he, he obviously avoids drinking that which is damaging to him. He takes and he drinks something that has a benefit. And his action... You see here that the decision of the Prophet, the actions of the Prophet have huge ramifications. And of course, this could, this could be symbolizing the, the, the massive ramifications of even the slightest decisions of the Prophet. And of course, the, the true meaning of these, of these incidents is only known to Allah. Then I was asked... Who's asking the Prophet? It's not mentioned. Perhaps an angel or maybe another Prophet who was in attendance. What did you see while you were on your journey? Meaning during the Isra. I replied, I replied from my right side. If you recall, the Prophet was ignoring voices that were calling him during this journey. He said, from my right side, someone called out to me. Jibra'il asked, did you reply to him? Did you reply to that voice that was 
calling you from your right side? The Prophet said, no, I ignored it. I did not reply. Jibra'i said that this person was a Jew, someone from Bani Israel. Had you answered his call, then after you pass away, your nation would have changed to the religion of the Jews. They would have been influenced and your religion would have not survived. They would, they would have been overtaken by the influence of Bani Israel. Jibra'il then asked, what else did you see? I replied, I then looked to my left and someone called me from that direction too. Jibra'il asked, did you reply to that call? So it seems from this narration that there were things that the Prophet was witnessing, that he was hearing that even Jibra'il was not aware of. So you see that the Prophet's his capacity and his awareness is at a higher level than even Jibra'il. Jibra'il asked, did you reply to that call that was coming from your left side? The Prophet said, no, I did not pay, pay attention to it either. Jibra'il said he was the one who was inviting you to the religion of Christianity. And Judaism and Christianity, the Jews and the Christians, they... They, exer- they tried to exercise a lot of influence over the Prophet and his followers. And Jibra'i said, had you paid any attention to him and replied to him, then after your death, your nation would have changed their religion to Christianity. Jibra'i then asked, who welcomed you? I replied, I saw a woman with open arms whom the various beauties of the world was being manifested through. She said to me, O Muhammad, come near me so that I may speak with you. Jibra'il asked, did you speak to her? I replied, no, I did not speak with her. Jibra'il then said, that woman was the physical manifestation of the material world. Because, you know, dunya, in that that realm, you know, things have certain manifestations. Because women are typically associated with, with beauty and The material world has its allure. It it was manifested in that uh, as that vision. So the so Jibra'i says, if you have if you would have answered or spoken to her, then your nation would have preferred this world over the next life. Now, one final comment is that we know that there there were those who deviated after the prophet. There were those who innovated. There were those who definitely preferred this world after over the, the hereafter. So how do, we, how do we reconcile what happened after the death of the Prophet with these statements, these declarative statements of Jibra'il? And the answer is quite simple, that perhaps the meaning is that if the Prophet failed in these trials these trials that he's experiencing during the Isra, no one would have been guided after him. So the fact that, yes, many were misguided after the Prophet, the fact that there were still a group who were committed and who were devoted and who were steadfast on the Prophet's teachings, this could be one of the effects of what's happening here uh, could be seen uh, because of these decisions uh, made by the Prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives blessings of hidayah because of uh, these trials, because of the because of because the Prophet passed these trials that were put before him during uh, the night journey. Inshallah in our next episode uh, we'll speak about the Mi'raj, the ascension of the Prophet, what the Prophet saw and uh, what he witnessed and we'll go through some of the ahadith uh, that speak to that. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in uh, to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. And I look forward to having you join us in our upcoming episodes. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Any questions or comments?
when you look at uh, the narration, let's go back to the So I'm looking at the, the Arabic. This could this could be because of the of the speed, you know, when you're traveling, you know, just to give a very simple example, when you're traveling at a at rapid speed, you know, this could be a gesture of respect just so the prophets, you know, clothes are not, you know, flapping. So the the angel as a gesture of respect for the prophet is holding his his clothes together as they as they uh they travel and again these are not physical clothes right the the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa his the, the body of the prophet you know the clothing everything about the prophet during this journey is compatible with with the, the the barzakhi forms that we mentioned. So the clothing of the Prophet could be a gesture of respect or it could be something that uh, is just practical because of the the speed of, uh, of that night journey to keep the Prophet's uh, clothes collected. No, I think that I think we can categorize those hadith. I think we can we can use this uh, these categories to divide any hadith. I mean, any any hadith that you have is either going to be mutawatir or it's not. And if it's not, it's either going to be rationally possible and it doesn't contradict the Quran, or it does. And if it does contradict the apparent meaning of the Quran, is it possible to be reinterpreted in a way that that conforms with reason and if not then it's considered to be fabricated so so yeah that's 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 a good uh, observation this this really applies to all hadith the carpet In the in Masjid and Nabi in Medina, I I'm not sure. I doubt. I highly doubt that that the carpet because I I've seen the the mihrab. I doubt that the carpet that's there is 14 centuries old. I I don't think any carpet would survive, you know, the wear and tear. Uh, so I, I I doubt that. I mean, I doubt that that carpet was. The actual carpet or rug that the Prophet stood on, you know, because we know that the Masjid of the Prophet was, you know, they they would pray on on soil. They didn't have rugs or carpet even to begin with. You know, if anything, they had straw mats at the most. You know the the Quran mentions that the the purpose of this is for the Prophet min ayatina to witness the signs of God to receive special knowledge and not just acquired knowledge the presential knowledge you know in many cases the the mi'raj takes place at per- during periods in the Prophet's life where he needs that uh, that boost of morale, you know, especially you know during the early Bi'tha, after the the death of Khadija, you know, we have to remember that the Prophet has been given a mission that you and I could not even comprehend the weight. 
the responsibility that is placed on the Prophet's shoulder. I mean, this is a man who has, who has been appointed by God to guide all human beings until the day of judgment. Can you imagine? I mean, how try to comprehend the magnitude of that task. And try to also comprehend, try to comprehend and try to grasp the hostility that he must have faced. No human being would have been able to endure or bear that type of mission. So there is a need for Allah to fortify the heart of the Prophet. And the Mi'raj, in many ways, of course, there is this element of receiving that sacred knowledge, that spiritual knowledge, that, that presential knowledge from God. But in addition to that, this is also Allah's way of consoling the Prophet, giving him that strength, because you need unimaginable strength and resilience to, do, to get this job done, to deliver God's final communication to humanity, to ensure that, that the message of God is delivered and conveyed, to, to deal with munafiqeen and kuffar and, I mean, the problems. And this is, the Prophet himself says, مَا أُوذِيَ نَبِيُّنُ بِمِثْلِ مَا أُوذِيَ No Prophet suffered as I suffered. When you read about all of, you know, what the Prophets experienced from Nuh to Ibrahim, Rasulullah says that my hardships outweigh the hardships of all prophets. So in order to, to compensate and to console the prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him something. Because his mission is unique, the prophet puts him through a sort of training program, a spiritual program that's also unique. And he consoles him and strengthens him and fortifies him in a way that he had not done for any previous prophet. Because of his capacity and because of the, the weightiness of the mission that he has been given, the mandate that has, he has been given. Does that make sense? So the prophet, the prophet is presented with wine, water, and and milk. And we know, Subhanallah. When you, you know, how does wine become wine? Wine becomes wine because of fermentation. So it's something that's essentially decaying and rotting, whereas Milk is something that has great nutritional value. So why is it that wine is being presented? This could be a type of test, type of imtihan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries His, His prophets. And this, we don't know what this symbolizes. Again, there is a lot of symbolism in these narrations. What does the milk represent? What does the water represent? What does the wine represent? And it seems from the from the uh, the narration that th these things have something to do. They are related to the the future and the destiny of the ummah. Now, how how is this? How does this connection exist? We don't know. So the prophet is told that if he drinks the water now. Water in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with it. Water is water. But the prophet drinking water means that the consequence of that action is what? He will perish and his nation will perish. What's the relationship? We don't know. If he takes the vessel of wine. Now wine, we know, the sharia prohibits it. He and his nation will be all led astray. But the milk... The milk, the Prophet drinks the milk and the Prophet made the right decision. What does drinking milk have to do with your ummah being guided and you being guided? We don't know. You know, sometimes we just have to admit that we don't know we don't know what it means. 
And we leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The location, it's possible, it's possible, but I don't know, I don't have any any information or any evidence to uh, to substantiate that or to deny that. Allahu alam, I don't know. Could you just talk a little bit about the difference between wilaya and wilaya? So, wilaya is guardianship. I mean, it depends on what you're referring to. So, you know, Allah has wilaya. The imams have wilaya. Now, wilaya is friendship. Whereas wilaya means guardianship. And, again, this is a very, this just this question needs an entire lecture, but, but in a nutshell, wilaya with a kesra refers to that you know our relationship with with god and those who have guardianship over us and you know there are certain requirements for this relationship and wilaya is friendship 